It's the 9th of November 2023, and you're watching Aim on Air, a specialised in connecting companies that shareholders is what we do best. Hello and welcome back to Aim On Air. My name's Liam. Today I'm pleased to be hosting Sean Day, Managing Director from Greatland, for a Q3 quarterly catch-up. Welcome back to the show, Sean. Thanks, Liam, and thanks for having me on uh, Aim On Air again. Not a problem, Sean. Uh, it's, it's always a pleasure. For, for our icebreaker today, I wanted to go back a couple of years uh, to when you were a teenager. Simon wonders if you had a particular computer game or TV show that sticks out in your mind as a memory of your youth. Uh, well, zero computer games. We 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 weren't allowed them in, in the home, so uh, so not that's not a memory for me. Uh, I remember going to other friends' houses and playing them, and they they were a treat. Look, uh, you know, to to be honest, I I was a big reader of uh, non-fiction books, so uh, you know that that's really and my dad. Um, you know, lectured in history. So really it was growing up around history books. So things like uh, Pax Britannica, Rise and Fall of the Greek Empire, they were they were the books I, you know, that's that's what I kind of grew up doing, which might not sound that exciting, but that, that was our household. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. That's fine. Thank you. Okay, so we're here today for our third quarter catch-up uh, for 2023, and uh, we're a bit out of sync with the traditional calendar months. But before I look back, I, I wondered, um, at the start of this week, Newmont completed its takeover own ownership of Newcrest Mining. Uh, I wondered if you had a few words now that the market is certain who our JV partner is going forward. Oh, yeah, look, we're, we're wrapped to, to bring Newmont into the joint venture. I, I think operationally they have you know, a, a tremendous reputation culturally again um led by tom palmer i think they're thought of you know very highly um as as a operate well not just as an operating team but as a group of people i think culturally we're a lot more aligned with newmont uh so we feel really really good about that uh and yeah and thirdly they're the world's largest gold miner uh so the fact that we fit in in their portfolio is is a credit to the to the Havron discovery. So we're we're wrapped to have them in. And and plus, look, it, it is a fresh set of eyes. Uh, I th I think they can bring in more value. I think they call it the full potential review. Uh, I I think they are again a really well respected technical team at this. So Havron will benefit greatly from that full potential review and and you know what they can do to to even more enhance the project. Okay, that, that's great. Thank you. So, so majority of the news items uh, from the previous quarter come from a flurry of RNSs between the 8th and the 20th of September. Some of these I'll not cover as they've since been superseded, but we should touch on each part of them um, to bring everybody up to date to the end of October. First up is the RNS on the 8th of September titled Newmont Newcrest Takeover. Grant Samuel produced an independent assessment of the Javier on project using its own assumptions. You and the team have had more time to digest this information and understand its nuances. Do you continue to find it frustrating that the real story of Javier on is still clouded in secrecy, for want of a better word, or are you just concentrating on the things that you can deliver? Yeah, thanks for the question, Liam. We we do just focus on on what we can deliver, and we're really comfortable with the successes we've had over the last um, 18 months in particular. In terms of the the AMC or the independent expert report, look, we we understand that we we we've kind of gone through it in some detail as as you would imagine. It, it you know, I think people should understand that represents seventy percent of Havron plus a hundred percent of Telfa. It doesn't delineate the two values, but I think it's arguable that Telfa, including its uh, rehab liability is actually a negative in that equation. So I, I, I think it, it does perhaps start to suggest what, what Havron can be, and people should also understand that independent experts are what you can prove, not what you know. So they are a subset of your expectation of, of the asset and, and typically have uh, you know, relatively conservative uh, assumptions in them. Uh, because again, it's it's about a public-facing technical review. 
uh, of an asset. And and obviously, when technical teams are doing that, they they they're really focused on on not uh, overestimating what can be achieved. So we we actually thought it was a step in the right direction. That's that's grand. Thank you. Uh, you then travelled around the world for a flurry of presentations and meetings with both institutions, investment companies, and private investors. W- were there any highlights uh, for you as you travelled around the globe? Yeah. Uh, look, I, I, it, it's always good to, to get out and meet with shareholders. Uh, I was able to do a town hall uh, meeting when I was in London, which which I I really enjoy, and 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 hopefully the people who come along enjoy and and find in, informative and engaging. Uh, certainly, I appreciate people turning up to that, and you know, I'm, I always try to, you know, spend, run over and and have a um, have a sandwich with them afterwards. So, I, you know, people have additional time to ask me questions because it's it's just great being involved in a company that that people are so engaged with. So, look, the, the so the highlight for me, you asked, is is always engaging, particularly with the town hall and the retail um, investment base. Having said that, the other highlight I think is the increased, um, you know, institutional engagement. Like to get an institution to come on as a shareholder can often take, you know, three, four, five meetings is is not ab- unusual, and, and I think that's starting to to bear fruit. I, I think every time we do a trip, we seem to have we seem to get another couple of institutional investors buying in. Uh, really, from a zero base, it's it's getting up towards a, a third of the share register, and and yeah, I really celebrate that. I think it's great that we still have this tremendously strong retail base, but we're bringing institutional demand in. I, I think over time, we think that helps build share price, but also um, reduce volatility, particularly downward volatility, because institutions will typically buy on value. So that's been a it's a, a bit of a slow burn to, to build up that institutional profile and engagement, but we feel it's been successful and will continue to be. That, 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 that's brilliant. Thank you very much. Midway through September, you announced that uh, our cornerstone investor, Wiley Metals, had entered into a loan agreement with Greatland uh, to provide a £26 million or £50 million Aussie dollar standby loan. Uh, given it's cost the company $1.5 million Aussie dollars already, do you have any plans to use this, or is this something that's there just in case? Uh, look, uh, a, a bit of both, really. Um, we we think you know having sufficient liquidity to to pay the um, calls of the joint venture is our highest priority. We obviously don't want any unplanned dilution, so having contingency there we think is a really important de-risking event for shareholders. Uh, we also think it, it it hopefully kind of removed, I think now incorrect uh, speculation that we were going to raise equity. So so th- those were the dual intent: one to create a platform where the share price could recover because there was no longer speculation that we're re- raising equity, and secondly, risk risk management. Um, so you know we we ultimately think we have sufficient funds to to pay the cash calls of the joint venture. So. In truth, we we don't expect to draw that the Wailu facility. Having said that, um, it, it is available there for us, so it, it it is available should the need arise. That, that's fair enough. Thank you. Uh, with that came the deferring of the ASX listing. You've been working on this for a year, which must be disappointing in, in some ways. Is it something that can be activated again quickly, or, or is there going to be a lengthy progress that needs to be started all over again? No, look, we, we've done a lot of the homework for it, so to speak. So I, I think the progress we've made is, is you know, stays, remains current and, and actionable. Again, we, we didn't want to, to do an ASX listing at a point in time when we, we felt there was, uh, you know, share price weakness. So this really allows us to have that ready to go, have a lot of the work in hand, having engaged with the ASX, and now we can sit back and think about the best timing. Uh, and our guidance for that is that we'll think about it at the right time in, in 2024, but we don't want to put a time frame on that. We don't want to create speculation around that. We just think we've done the work, we're ready to go. And now we can just optimize it for shareholders and particularly for existing shareholders. And I think that's what I was really trying to convey with that is that our primary thought is to existing shareholders. Yep, we love welcoming in new shareholders, new shareholders bring new demand, 
but fundamentally our primary obligation is to existing shareholders, which I'm one of. That really does make sense. Uh, thank you for that one. Since our first interview, um, we, we keep talking about Ernest Giles, and on the 20th of September, we received news that land access agreement is now in place. Whilst there's no official word that uh, this has commenced or any work has been started, it's been noted by Paddy Gall on Twitter, or X if that's what you prefer, that there's been some ground clearances taking place. Have you managed to secure a drill rig that might see you get one into the ground before Christmas? Um, that is certainly our intent. Uh, I, I think... When we have a drill rig on the ground, I'd, I'd like to probably RNS announce it. So you can take from that that we don't presently have a, a rig on the ground, but we are doing everything we can to try to get some drilling done by the end of, you know, before the end of the calendar year. Obviously, as as time passes by, that that becomes, you know, har harder to achieve, but we haven't changed that guidance either. So yeah, look, we've we've we're taking steps to give ourselves every opportunity to do it. It is reasonably hard to get rigs in Australia right now, but but equally we we feel we um we're well placed to manage that. So you know, we I I, I don't want to preempt anything, but we are certainly focused on trying to achieve that. We love Ernst Giles. We we think together with the Patterson, Ernest Giles is just a tremendous additional outlet for our exploration team. And these first holes, we have EIS funding for if we can get them done in, in short order. So we're certainly, so EIS funding is from the West Australian government where they, they co-fund um, exploration holes. So we're, we're really focused on that. And personally, uh, you know, I'm, you know, Ernest Giles is, is my favourite exploration um, opportunity. Uh, and I presume that um, it actually just accessing it in general is, is really difficult given it's in the middle of, it's in the middle of nowhere, isn't it? Oh, look, the, the, you know, there's a lot of remote places in Western Australia. So it, it's, it's no more in the middle of nowhere than, than, than many other places. That, and, you know, Havron isn't okay. exactly on a, on a main street either. So, so the, we're, we're used to that. We've got a team um, structured around that. There's certainly places, you know, further east or, or further out and, and further, uh, you know, further or more remote than, than where Ernest Giles is. So, but having said that, it is remote even by Western Australian standards. And that, and that does feed into the logistical program of getting out there. H having said that, I think we've got a team that are well-versed in, in meeting those challenges safely and efficiently. Super, thank you. So, technically speaking, uh, this next question should really come in our next quarter update. But as you're here, and we've already touched on it in our news segment a couple of weeks ago, I wondered if you could just clarify the new timeline, given the pause and decline development, and what this does to Greatland's expected timeline. Yeah, so look, the, the lower contained aquifer is the third aquifer in the sequence to reach the, the bottom of the ore body. It's exactly the same approach to, to all three, which is uh, you know, drill them from from distance to try to understand the 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 um the width or the depth really of of the aquifer, which is effectively just porous rock. It, these are not open areas; they're just areas where the the rock is more porous. So you've got a, a higher level of water generation. We depressurize them with initial holes, and then we do wider diameter holes to um so we can pump them out. And we try to get the ground relatively dry before we um, drive through it with the, the decline. And we typically do the spirals um, through these uh, aquifers as, as we did in the two above, uh, just because we, we like to do the um, straights in the really competent ground so we can build up speed and, um, and uh, cut length. So th this is more of the same. Or, or, albeit um, we're, we're effectively just trying to drive up to the pause point uh, where we start dewatering this, and and but work continues. We just pivot to doing the uh, the ventilation back a little bit above us, which is joining up those spirals um, so that there's a continuous second airway. So effectively, work doesn't cease. We just pivot from advancement in the decline to catching up with the ventilation work, which needs to be done. 
And then ultimately mm. we restart that and we expect to, yeah, I don't want to give a date until we are, you know, specifically dewatered but, and when we recommence, but we are very close to the top of the ore body. So it, it's, it's a relatively short number of months once we get underway again. Uh, and we also think we can get that feasibility study done in that um, September quarter as well. But we'll confirm dates um, once we've completed the dewatering work or, or at least substantially have completed it. No, that, that, that does make sense. Thank you for clarifying. Um, uh, this one is just a general one, really, uh, and maybe it's just needing your view or to see if you have a comment on it. I've noticed over the course of 2023 that there are several companies all under the Greatland umbrella now. As the company structure becomes established in Australia, Greatland Exploration, Greatland Holdens, Greatland Resources, Greatland Jury, and Greatland Nuco, which I believe to be the new public traded company. Um, is, is there any, apart from the obvious benefit of ring fencing, um, what are the difference between the holdings, resources, and exploration companies? Oh, uh, look, they're, they're, they're all 100% owned subsidiaries, so that there's, there's not a lot of change. Um, look, when, when I joined, it was all just one vehicle. This meant our joint venture holdings and other assets were all in a single uh, you know, corporate vehicle, which Newcrest had an interest in. Uh, I'm not sure that was ideal. Um, by separating that, that out, it just allowed us to deal with each asset individually and and also meant that any recourse um, you know, was limited to the to the asset um, uh, of the joint venture rather than kind of the entire um, group. So it, it, we simplified it from for, for legal issues as well. So it was, Somewhat housekeeping, they're all 100% owned by Greatland. It was really just, um, you know, sh shuffling the deck chairs rather than actually um, getting new deck chairs. So it, it was relatively straightforward, but I think a, a better structure and a more thoughtful structure. Okay. And in terms of the top hat when it comes, it would go above those. Is that kind of how yeah, that would work? Yeah, correct. Um, again, the top hat uh, would only be kind of introduced around a, an, an ISX listing just to, to have a single vehicle for that. But you know, that's, again, a, 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 you know, to my mind, relatively straightforward when the time comes. Okay. Thank you. My, my last question, um, and a very slightly different approach, uh, comes from my wife um, over Cornflakes this morning. I was discussing that uh, we were talking to you and she received an email regarding the AGM uh, and its proposals that you've got coming up uh, in a month's time. Uh, being a, an accountant and stuff, she took a bit of nosy around the company accounts. And the one thing that stood out to her was the amount that had been spent on salaries and share options. She'd just like to know, and, and I tried to defend it and answer it as best I could. I know probably what you're going to say, but she wanted to hear it from the horse's mouth. And I said, OK, I'll ask him. So she'd like to know, please, how, you, how we can justify spending this money when the share price has declined so much and, and there's zero cash flow at the moment. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Lynn. Look, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question, so it's actually good to, to talk about it uh, on the program. Look, fundamentally... Uh, yeah, what what should be understood is that over eighty percent of that uh, remuneration number is non cash, and and that's been our approach because well your wife is exactly right we are pre cash flow, so what we've tried to do is obviously everyone likes receiving cash in their pocket, but what we've tried to do is remunerate our team in a different way. Um, both at a board level and at a uh, management team level. And predominantly that's been with out of the money options uh, at 11.9 pence. Now, I think they were 45% out of the money when they were uh, issued to the directors and about 63% out of the money when they were issued to the management team. But that is the incentive. And, and I think that is the alignment with shareholders. I think we'd all like to see the, the share price go up. And we think we've put in a, a, a board and a management team aligned and dedicated to that purpose. But also this was around retention and getting people in what, in the Australian mining market right now, is, is an incredibly um, you know, challenging and, and competitive space. And I, and I think we've picked the eyes out of it. And also remember, this was a one-off. 
Yep, it was a, a reasonably large one-off. It locks people in for a period till we deliver Havron, but also it locked people in for what's been a pretty remarkable period where, you know, we've come in with a joint venture agreement which had some really non-market terms. For, for instance, we ended up having to go into a, a long arbitration process with, with our joint venture partner to, to avoid you know, selling more of Havron at, a, at, a, at an extremely low price. We went through that and, I, and yeah, I think we were really successful in that. And then also we had, Greatland had undertaken to pay its 30% share of development with really no pathway to cash flow. So we, the team that we've had to bring in uh, had to go out and get the funding for that. And that was done in, in a number of ways, both with equity markets and in terms of getting bank support and bringing in Wailu as a strategic. So really, I think we couldn't have achieved all that without the team we have, both at the board and the management level. And to do that with non-traditional, non-cash um, payments or, or remuneration, which aligns with shareholders. I, look, I hope people understand that. From my perspective, I think it's been a, a really good way to thread the needle, to get a good team without having short-term cash flows. And, and if those options do come into the money, it's a, it's a really nice inflow of cash into the company. Uh, and we're all doing well at that point. But remember, it's not just achieving 11.9 pence. At that price, the options are still worth zero. It's about encouraging management to exceed that target. So that, that hopefully puts that in context for, for your listeners, but, but also for your breakfast table discussions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, incidentally, do you, uh, do you know how much it would raise if uh, everybody was to action their shares at the price? I think it's just over 50, maybe even 60 million pounds. So it's a decent number, uh, which would be, you know, presumably is happening as we're going into production, which would really solve any working capital I issues we'd need. So it's actually, to some extent, for, for both personal reasons, but also for all shareholders, I'd like to think we're going to hit and exceed that target. I, I like to think what we've effectively done is a placement at a magnificent premium. So, but time will tell. So, I mean, the, the more I sit down and look at the Greatland as a company and everything it's got going for it, from the board to the projects to everything else, the, the future is really bright for this company, isn't it? Look, I, I, I like to think so. And indeed, I, I voted with my feet to come and join Greatland. And the reasons I, I did that are unchanged. You know, one, we have a world-class ore body in, in Havron, which will continue to expand. Two, we have the ongoing expiration um, upside to that, which, which I think is exciting and, and, and tangible and real. And three, I think we've got a really interesting, you know, corporate overlay here where, you know, where there's, there's option value in our stock. Now, whether that because Newmont decides this is, you know, one of their premier assets, and wants to you know, own 100 percent or whether that's because there's an opportunity to, to buy the farm back or whether it's just because we're going to go into production and have a tremendous cash flow underlying our, our, our company. I think all of those gives us a, a brilliant um, platform for growth. So I'm, I'm really excited about the platform we have and the progress we've made getting this closer and closer to the day where we turn Havron on, I think, you know, sets us up for value over the short to medium term. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, sadly, that's the end of this webcast, ladies and gents. And if you want to reach out to us, you can contact us on Twitter with the address that's on the screen. And before you close this page, I'd be grateful of any thumbs up. This interview is supported by your donation. So if you enjoyed it or learned something today, please consider buying a coffee on the link on the screen now. Sean Day, Managing Director of Greatland Gold PLC, thank you for coming on to the show to discuss the previous quarter. Do you have any last words for your shareholders today? No, thanks for having me. Thanks for the discussion and, and for shareholders. Look, thanks for the support and hopefully... Uh, people will still want to keep 
um, asking questions and, and attending um, town halls because uh, I, I certainly find them beneficial and I hope, uh, I hope shareholders do as well. Absolutely. Um, out of interest, will you be making it to the AGM uh, in December? That, that is my plan, but the, one lesson, the other one lesson I've learned this year is not to um, talk about London travel dates until <laughs> I have uh, a flight book, so okay. um, a, a provisional yes. Okay, that's understandable. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, until next time, my name's Liam, and you've been watching Aim On Air, where specialising in connecting companies with shareholders is what we do best. Thank you.